read in the bulletin, and that is these two ladies, Leanne uh, Roddenhurst and Kaleo Park, they have done fantastic. You know, they came up to me, remember Daryl, about a month and a half ago, and they said, P-Dub, can we be in charge of Halloween? And they've actually never really been in charge of anything, and they just kind of stepped up because, you know, I was dumb enough to preach this message. The Holy Spirit speaks. You need to do what you hear, right? So they did, and I'm like, yeah, sure, go ahead. Praise God. But they've done awesome. They've done better, better than anybody I've seen in recent years. So everybody, give, give them a hand, please, for the job they're doing administrating. And now give the Holy Spirit a hand for what he's able to do through them. Untrained, untested, they've never been in charge of a church activity before, and yet now they're doing great. That means that the Holy Spirit, if you use your faith, can use you to do great things, even though you have never done it before. If you hear the Holy Spirit telling you to go minister to somebody, pray for healing for somebody, pray deliverance for somebody, evangelize them. If you know that's the Holy Spirit's voice in you telling you to do it, you don't have to have done it before. You don't necessarily need a whole lot of training. You just need the anointing of the Holy Spirit moving. Can I hear an amen? amen. And trust in that. Anyway, let's uh, everybody stretch your hands forward. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, God, for all these gifts that are a symbol of people's faith and trust in you. See, right here, Lord, they trust you to bless them. Holding it in their hand and keeping it is trusting in their ability to invest and to uh, maneuver it correctly. Putting it in here means they trust you to bless them and protect them. So, Lord, we ask you to cast your hedge of protection around them. Surround them with your shield of favor. And answer, Lord, their prayers for healing and for deliverance and for blessing and for anointing. And now, Lord, our prayer this morning is that you would speak to us. That we, as your bride, would be washed by the water of your word. Lord, we desire to walk with you more closely. And we know that that means to increase our faith. So, Lord, we ask, and if you believe this and you, you, you agree with me, Say amen. We want our faith to be greater when we leave this morning than it is now. Right now, this very minute, Lord, you can see my faith, and I ask that it would be increased and would be greater before I leave this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Remember, we've been talking about faith, and we've been talking about how faith is, although you and I can't see faith, it's a spiritual substance that God can see. God can actually see it. It's like, for instance, uh, I'm a chef, right? So when I'm cooking something or somebody is cooking, I can tell you if the base uh, fat is oil or butter. Most of you can too. You don't have to see the olive oil put in. You don't have to see the butter spread in there. But just by the smell of it, you can tell whether there's butter or olive oil. Yes or no? God is that same way when it comes to faith. You and I may not be able to see it, but he can smell it. He can smell the faith on you. Is that all right for me to say? He can smell the faith on you. And so we want our faith to increase. We want our faith to increase. When Jesus was talking about forgiving or just applying the word of God in Luke chapter 17, verse 5, as the apostles heard him preach to them, about how you have to forgive and you have to walk in my ways and you have to live uh, and make these choices and decisions. What was their, what was their response? Their, their response wasn't as ours is so many times. Oh, God, help me. Instead, very maturely and, and with a lot of wisdom, they looked at Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Say that with me, please, if you mean it. Increase our faith. Now, we know here in this church what faith is. We've broken it down before. Faith is hearing, understanding, believing, and choosing to act on that belief. Hearing comes by the word of God. I would that you would understand my word. Believe and then act. You hear the word of God either preached to you this morning or on the radio or you read it uh, 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 for yourself and your mind hears it. But 
You got to hear the word of God, not the truth of the world, not the opinions of people around you, but you got to hear the word of God. Amen. What are you supposed to hear? Then you need to understand it. God is love. Say it with me. God is love. Does that mean that anytime somebody feels like they're extending love, that that must be God? Because there's a whole bunch of child molesters out there who would tell you, you know, I love these kids. I feel love towards them. But is that love? No. See, we need to understand what it is that God says in His Word. So we need to hear the Word, understand it, choose to believe it. Now, what does belief mean? Is this right or wrong? Is this good or bad? Is this appropriate or inappropriate? If when I hear the Word of God, I decide and choose in my mind and my heart to say, this is right. This is good. This is appropriate. When I make that decision and I choose to believe it's right, good, and appropriate, I now believe the Word of God. I've not only heard it, I not only understand it, now I believe it. Now, somewhere in the human mind and the human heart, that belief has to become faith. Question, at what point does your belief become faith? William, at what point? See, because it's something that is in the mind and it's in the heart. You can have faith, you can have belief, but God can smell the faith on you. He knows when that happens, but how do you know? How do you know when you really have faith in something and you just don't have belief? See this pin? Everybody watch William. See this pin? I'm going to throw you this pen. Okay, and you're going to catch this pen. Ready? Here it comes. Faith. See, the moment his hands moved and something in his mind told him, not only is Pastor Wendell capable of throwing me in the pen, not only does he have the pen in his possession, he's willing to throw me the pen, he's able to throw me the pen, but the minute those hands went up there and he was expecting to receive it, that's when belief becomes faith. That's when the power of God begins to move. So, the power of God begins to move when we hear and understand the Word of God and it becomes faith. Now, last week we were talking about how we want our faith to increase. That's what the apostles are praying here in Luke. Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Is that your prayer this morning as well? Increase our faith so that, according to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13, you don't have to turn there. It's a very familiar passage about putting on the full armor of God. When our faith increases, we can stand against the wiles of the enemy. We can extinguish his fiery darts. How many know the, the enemy wants to tear you down? He may try to tear you down this morning. Sunday morning, by the way, is Satan attack hour. Okay, the hour before you leave for church is Satan attack hour. Everything will go wrong. Guess how to avert that? Start the day with prayer. And by the way, the prayer I'm talking about is not waking up and going, Oh God, that's not the prayer I mean. And there is power in the name, but if the alarm clock goes off and you go, Jesus, that's not the same either. Okay? You start the day with prayer. Oh, Lord, in Jesus' name, I want to get to church today. I want to serve you. I want to serve your people. Help me get there in the name of Jesus. Guess what? The shroud of God's favor comes all over you because you've gone to him first. You make him your first priority. He'll make you his first priority. It's amazing to me how many people, you know, have trouble, uncle, in the morning to get to uh, 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 Sunday church. And when I say, well, did you pray about it? They're like, huh? I don't feel like praying on Sunday mornings. I'm like, perfect time to come to church then, I guess. But that's one of the ways of averting all this trouble, and that helps you extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy. He wants you to be ready to withstand the darts. He wants you ready to go through life. Uh, uh, how many of you guys took karate or any sort of, uh, right? Remember what the word ajime means? Ajime! Hi. Right? You get into fighting position. Horse stance. I hated horse stance. Still to this day, I hate horse stance. I am too heavy and too old not to even demonstrate it. But all the weight goes on you. And like, I hate that. But that's a fighting position. That's getting ready to fight. That's getting ready to receive the attack of the enemy and repel it and withstand it. Faith helps you defeat the enemy. And faith, as faith increases, enables you 
to be victorious against the enemy. See, here's the thing. How many of you want to go through life without trouble, without any problems at all? See, that's not God's will for you. Anybody here play video games? Right? Okay, video games. What's your favorite video game? Don't tell me anything occultic. Tomb Raider. <laughs> kind of flirting with it. Of course, to be honest now, I like Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. And there's all kinds of dark, gooky things in there as well. Right? But here's the thing. You guys play RPGs. Somebody tell me what an RPG stands for. Role-playing game. Look at Jermaine. Yeah, me too. But here's the thing. Role-playing game, you're this little sprite. You're this little character, and you're going through this game, 3D, and you're running all through the countryside. Here's the thing. Everybody who plays an RPG, remember the old days of Game Shark, Code Breaker? You used to love those, because you used to put in this code, and you used to be able to go into a game in what we called, very, very uh, heretically, by the way, God mode. And what God mode means is, you have unlimited power. God moan means you cannot be hurt or injured. And God moan means that you have all money. Every time you try to spend money, it just automatically goes back in there. They don't have that anymore. Okay, but when I was playing games, they used to have God mode. And you used to like going through the game, right, John? If you could be in God mode. Because, I mean, who wants to go through an RPG and not have any enemies? Who wants to go through an RPG and not have any prizes, not have any challenges, not have any puzzles, not have anything, just wander through the countryside? There's nothing there but birds and butterflies. Yeah, it's like Animal Crossing, right? You play that for like about two minutes and like a... And you turn it off. Well, that is exactly what God wants to do with you in life. He wants you to go through life in God mode. Spiritually, in God mode. How many, how many understand what I'm talking about? Say amen. He wants you to understand that spiritually you cannot be hurt. He wants you to understand that spiritually you have access to unlimited power. He wants you to understand that no matter how much sorrow and anger and fear the world throws at you, He, the Holy Spirit within you, can always refill it and you have a constant source of refreshment and strength and comfort, and peace, and joy, and love, and power that you need. That's what faith does. And that's why God wants our faith to increase. Now, when he was talking to Peter about being attacked by the enemy, and what the enemy would want to do to him to steal his faith, Jesus says this, and if you want to, you can turn with me. Well, that's not. That takes too much time. <laughs> this is what Jesus says to Peter, okay? Jesus says, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. Sift you like wheat. However, I have prayed, and this is where we kind of ended last week's Sunday. We, if I, it had been me, Fallon, I would have prayed. You know, I have Jesus saying, you know, Satan wants to attack you. Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed, dot, dot, dot. I'm hoping that the tagline to that is that he could not touch you, that he has to stay away from you, that you have this protection around you. Instead, this is what Jesus prays. I have prayed that your faith would not fail. I want to be protected. I want to be delivered. I want to be taken out of this. Instead, you pray that my faith will not fail. What you want me to do is be able to go through the arrows. You want me to be able to go through the testing, but maintain the fruit of the Spirit and be victorious. He wants to sift Peter. Satan does. He wants to sift you. When you go to the mainland, Josh, Satan is going to want to sift you. He's going to want to sift you. He's trying to sift both of you guys. Rose, Lisa, he wants to sift you. He wants to sift you, my son. Satan wants to sift you. And God is going to let him do it. Because 
when he told Peter, Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed that you would not lose faith. This is what Jesus wants to allow to have happen in your life. He wants Satan to sift you, but he wants your faith to not fail. Why? Increase in faith. A lot of people don't understand the sifting process in Israel. Now, uh, in Israel, you would harvest wheat and you would have a sifting basket. Now, the sifting basket was round and this part was kind of uh, wood. Okay? That was a wood part here. So all this is wood. But then in here, in this basket, was a bottom that had a grate of rattan. Anybody know where rattan comes from? Palm trees. You take a palm tree, you strip off the bark, you take a planer, you pull it down, you have these long fibers of very thin uh, uh, bits, and you take that and you pull them apart and you have these little things, and you weave it together in a grid, and in this wooden ring, which is about yay big, you would have this grate of rattan. Now the reason it had to be rattan, and the reason it had to be fresh, Chris, is because it was soft, it was pliable, and it would move. Now wheat, tell me what the shape of wheat is. It's like that, right? It's a long, thin kernel. And what happens is this. You put all the harvested wheat that dries out and gets beaten and flailed into this sieve, is what it's called. And two things happen. You take the sieve and you throw the wheat up into the air. And the wind has to be kind of blowing a little bit. And what happens as you throw and you toss this wheat with the sieve is two things. Number one, the wheat and the chaff go in the air, the wind is blowing, and that separates wheat from chaff. That's called separation. So that's good from bad. You can't eat the hull of the wheat. It's inedible and it's going to give you all kinds of abdominal problems if you try to eat it. So that all flies away. And what you're left with in the basket, in the sieve, is a combination of the dirt and the stones and the husked wheat itself. Now, follow me close. This sieve here, this grate here, a lot of people think the wheat stays in the sieve and the rocks and the dirt go all the way through. Not so. It's the, actually the other way around. As you toss the wheat in the air and as it's coming down, the, the women and the men who do this thing kind of like meet the wheat with the sieve so that it impacts it even further so that this little kernel, if it's heavy enough, if it's healthy enough, and if it's oily enough, will go straight through this soft, pliable grid and will fall to the bottom. And so what winds up happening is this. All the chaff winds up blowing away and all the wheat, the really good healthy wheat, that all gathers down here. And the first, this is also called grading by the way, because the wheat that first comes out of this thing is the healthiest, is the oiliest, that's like grade A wheat, that's something that humans eat. Now what gets left in here is a bunch of rocks and a bunch of wheat that will have to go into another kind of sieve, and it's going to be a little bit dirtier, so they use that for animals. But what comes through here is what people eat. Follow me so far. This is what Satan wants to do with you. He wants to sift you like wheat. God also wants to have you sifted like wheat, but to two different ends. Satan wants to... See, and here's why, I put, put it, here's why I pointed this out. It's because it is the wheat that has to go through this grate. It has to be thrown in the air. It has to be tossed back and forth. And it is the part that has to be forced through this grid. Not the bad part. The wheat. Now, what does the wheat symbolize? Any guesses? Okay. Wheat. Jesus was talking about, and you don't have to turn there, but in Matthew chapter 13, he's talking about the sower of the seed. And he's talking about the seed. And, he says, and basically what it is, is the seed is the word of God. And when it gets planted, it brings a harvest. So basically what this is, is this. Wheat is kind of your choices and decisions. 
It's your choices and decisions, whether they are going to be godly or whether they're going to be ungodly. For instance, you see a substance. You know you have an addiction problem. It's tempting to you. I do this substance, I'm going to feel great for like an hour or two. But, number one, it's destructive, and I hurt other people when I do this. And number two, this is not pleasing to the Lord. So now I have a choice. I have a decision. Am I going to do it, or am I not going to do it? There is a relationship that is ungodly for you. The Word of God says you are not supposed to go there. I'm not married to this person. I'm not joined to this person. This is not, an, this is not a God-approved relationship. But nonetheless, she's willing, or he's willing. Do I say yes or no? All these choices and decisions or what face you? Should I lie on my taxes? Should I speed on the highway? Should I lie to my mother when she asks me this question? All of these things are what life is. Your life is a series of choices and decisions. And you need to have faith to hear what the Word of God says in terms of those choices, understand what God's saying, believe it, and then choose to act on it. So these choices and decisions that you go through life are going to go through a sifting process. They're going to be tested. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be rough. Whether you tithe or not, for instance, the testing period is going to come when you're going through financial stress. You know, whether my wife and I stay together or not, that's going to be tested at times when our relationship is strained and we're going through family problems. That's when that's going to come. When I am depressed, when I'm frustrated, when I'm angry, is when somebody's going to show up and offer me to sell me some sort of substance. You understand how Satan does this? He always hits you when you are weakest. This is the sifting process. But this is how your faith increases if you choose to do the right thing. Because here's the thing. Satan wants to sift you. God wants you sifted. But the motivation is different. Satan wants to sift you, Pat, so that you show up with all rocks. I'm going to put you through a hard time. I'm going to put you through stress. I'm going to put you through worry and anger and sorrow and anxiety. And what I want to see produced in you is all the rocks. I want to see you get ticked off. I want to, I want to see you get frustrated. I want to, to see you get addicted. I want to see you put in bondage. I want to see you hurt other people. I want to see you damage your own life. This is what I want to see. I want to see rocks. Meanwhile, God is looking here. I'm going to let the sifting process take place because what I want to see produced is grade A wheat. I want to see love for me and your fellow man produced. I want to see joy in your heart even though you're going through a hard time. I want to see peace in your mind even though you're going through an anxious time. I want, you, I want to see you remain kind, good, gentle, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. I want to see all that maintained in you. And that's why he allows this sifting process to take place. So that you trust in the Lord and you trust in His Word and you do not trust in what you see. Turn with me briefly to Jeremiah 17 just for a minute. I'm not going to end here, but I want to show this to you just for a second. How many of you want to live to be a righteous man or woman of God? Say amen. amen. Let me show you the difference. Before you answer really firmly and you go all in, let me show you the difference. In Jeremiah 17, starting with verse 5, it says this. This is what the Lord says. And remember, we're talking about sifting. Teaching you whether you are going to trust in the things of man that appear to give you comfort or trust in the things of God that will give you the fruit of the Spirit. And how you choose and decide what, you, what to do with yourself and your resources, that's this. Faith or doubt. Cursed is the one, Jeremiah 17, 5, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who depends on flesh, his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Now stop to think about this. Cursed is the man. Your life is not going to go well. God doesn't want this for you. If you are trusting in what you feel and what you think and what you decide and how you want to map out your life and what makes sense to you, if you're trusting in man and the things that give men strength, cursed are you. Your heart will turn away from the Lord. 
He will be like a bush in the wastelands. He will not see prosperity when it comes. He will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. In a salt land where no one lives. That means nobody is going to be there to share your life. You're going to destroy everything around you. But, somebody say but. Verse 7. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Whose confidence is in Him. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. I know if I take this substance, I'm going to feel better for a, a, a bit, but the Word of God says I'm not supposed to be in bondage to anything. I'm going to say no. That's an attractive girl. That's an attractive guy. But this is not my time, and this is not the way it's supposed to be done. I'm going to say no. They want me to go with them to go do this thing. And it's fun, and it's wild, and it's cool, and it's hot, and it's so not what the Lord wants. I'm not going to do that. Because my confidence is in the Lord, not in the things that the world identifies as good. Somebody say amen. amen. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when the heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries. Somebody say no worries. In a year of drought and never fails, never fails to bear fruit. Becoming, having your faith increase accomplishes this. Now last week we talked about faith. And there's all different kinds of faith. Jesus talked about no faith. Jesus talked about little faith. He talked about sufficient faith. He talked about great faith. And he talked about full faith. How do you know what kind of faith you have? Give me five more minutes, okay? Turn with me to... How do I want to do this? Okay, turn with me to Mark, Mark, Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. Mark 4. Wasn't that a Lincoln model? Never mind. Um, way long ago. Okay. Um, Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 35. We're trying to identify what little faith is or no faith is. This is the second storm out of three storms that Jesus and the disciples go through. Okay? This is the second storm. Mark chapter 4, starting with verse 35, that day when evening came, he, that is Jesus, said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. And a furious squall came up. This is not the seismic earthquake this is not the hurricane. This is a squall. This is the windstorm. And waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Now remember, they've been through this before with him. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Remember, Jose, this is the one where Jesus actually brings a pillow with him because he, he's planning on going to sleep. The disciples woke him and said to him, and here's your key. Ready? Teacher, rabbi. Don't you care if we drown? Say that with me. Don't you care if we drown? One more time. Don't you care if we drown? No faith means you're not sure whether God loves you or not. You're not sure if Jesus cares about you or not. This is not doubt in God's existence. This is not doubt in God's ability. This is not doubt in God's power. This gets to the very heart of where Satan sent the spear into Eve's heart in Genesis chapter 3. First, Satan has her question. Did God really say that? But that's not really where the spear goes in. She doesn't really know her word, but I mean, who really knows the word perfectly? I don't, you don't. But here's where the spear really goes in. No, 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 no. You will not die on that day. For God knows in that day you will become like him, knowing the difference between good and evil. What Satan is doing here is he's convincing Eve, 
God doesn't really love you. He doesn't really care about you. He's powerful. He's a Shylock. He calls all the shots. He makes you jump through these hoops. But he does it just to please himself. He doesn't really care about you. And he doesn't really love you. And here is where any faith you have, whether it's great faith, sufficient faith, or little faith, becomes no faith. Is if you buy the line, God doesn't really care. This is what kills faith. God doesn't really care. He doesn't really give a rip. If Satan can convince you of that one, he will cancel any faith you have. doesn't matter where you are, you're going to go straight to no faith because that's exactly what Jesus says to them. Oh, how can you have no faith? No faith. Because you don't believe that God cares. You see bad things happening. You see tests and trials come. You're being sifted. And here's the thing about the sifting process. Ready, Chris? Here's the thing. To the wheat, it feels the same. Whether it is God sifting or whether it is Satan sifting, it feels the same to the wheat. The wheat cannot tell a difference. All I know is I want to be healthy and I'm sick. All I know is I want to be rich and I'm poor. All I know is I want to be happy and I'm sad. All I know is I want to get to church on time and every single light is turning red. All I know is that everything I want to have happen is not happening. Whether God is the one doing the sifting or whether Satan's the one doing the sifting, the wheat is the same. It's like, whoa, it's flying through the air. It doesn't know any difference. And it becomes very easy, flying through the air, to say, God doesn't care. Why would he let this happen? Why would he let this, me go through this? And we forget. We want our faith to increase. And one of the ways that happens is, we allow the sifting process to take place so that we learn to trust in the Lord. See, the key to this illustration here in Mark chapter 4 is this. They've gone through a storm before. They had seen Jesus calm a storm before. They should have known he was able to do this, and they should have known they were going to be okay. Instead, they come to him and they say, don't you care that we are dying? It's not a lack of faith in his ability to calm the storm. They know he can do that. And so too it's true for you, you know God can give you riches. You know God can heal you immediately. You know God can provide you with everything you ask for and everything you want in a moment, and yet for some odd reason, He's not. And so this is where the sifting spear comes through. God doesn't care. And that voice comes up in your heart. That voice comes up in your mind. Jesus, don't you care that I'm going through this? And in that moment, no matter where you are, you lose your faith. And Jesus would say, how can you have no faith? See, Job in 13.15 says one of the most powerful things that actually validates the entire book of Job. As he's tested and he goes through all these horrible things, what is it he says? Anybody know Job 13.15? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. One more time. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. One more time. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Job 13, 15. Even if he, and by the way, that word slay, katal, execute. Even though God chooses to take my life on purpose. Now, not just he lets it happen. He actually is the one who takes it. He's the one who lets me get sick. He's the one who lets me get hit by a car so that off I go. Though he slay me, though he be my executioner, yet will I trust in him. Because I know what happens. Right? We sang it this morning. One glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. The Bible says in the book of Luke that one day you're going to be short of breath. One day something is going to happen. You'll get dizzy for a second. And boom, your body will fall. Your heart will stop beating. Your brain will stop functioning. And it'll stop firing those little synapses. 
But the Bible says, Jesus says, in that day, angels will come get you. Angels will come get you. And they will carry you to the presence of the Lord. One glad day, when this life is over, you will fly away. Now here Job is saying, though he slay me, even if he intentionally kills me, yet will I trust in him. Take my money, take this, take that. It's okay because I trust in you, Lord. This is a man who's being sifted. He's in the process of being sifted. And his trust comes through. How many would say that with me this morning? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. See, the way to exculpate yourself from this is to realize God loves you. God loves you. How many know that? Say amen. amen. I'm going to read this for you and then I'm peace out for today. Okay. I want you to turn with me to eh, 1 John. 410. I'm there, I win. This is love. 1 John 4.10. This is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. We know that we live in Him and He in us because He has given us His Holy Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be Savior of the world. All this to say, we know God loves us because He sent us Jesus. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in Him and He in God. But verse 16 is what I want you to highlight tonight. So we know and rely on the love God has for us. So we know. Who knows in this house of the Lord that He loves you? So we know... And we rely on the love God has for us. We know and we rely on the love God has for us. We know and we rely on the love God has for us. At the end of the day, it's not about understanding the word, John. In the end of the day, it's not about becoming a scholar. At the end of the day, Kaleo, it's not about how long somebody has been a believer. It is about how firmly you really, really believe God loves you. And the second you throw your arms up in the air and say, you know what? It never really hit me before. You love me. God loves me. He sees me. He knows me. He loves me. That will change everything. Now, right now, this morning, I'm going to pray for you because Satan wants to convince you that because of what you're going through, God doesn't really care. Some of you have fallen for it, and you're going to take that burden, and you're going to cast it off of yourself this morning. In fact, you're going to do it right now. Ready? Close your eyes. Lift your hands to the Lord, especially if you really know you need this thing broken on you today. In the name of Jesus. We come before you, Lord, and we acknowledge you love us. Father, forgive me. And if this is you, say amen. Father, forgive me for entertaining the lie that you don't care. Father, forgive me for entertaining the lie that you do not love me. Forgive me for looking so much on what's going on around me that I forget what's going through me. Your love, your grace, your mercy, your power. And so in the name of Jesus and by the power of his blood, I take authority over every antichrist spirit in this building right now in Jesus' name. I break your hold on every single one of these people and I command you to loose them now, 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 now. I feel it. Now. Come on, Holy Spirit. Now. Now. Now in Jesus' name. And Holy Spirit, hope you guys are ready for this. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, give everybody here who's praying a fresh anointing of your love. 
right now in the name of Jesus. Right now in the name of Jesus. Pour it over them like oil. Set their hearts on fire with the knowledge that you love them. With the knowledge that you love them. Now begin to confess it. If you really believe it now, don't let me sell you a bunch of goods. But if the Holy Spirit has touched you this morning, just say it, Lord, you love me. Lord, you love me. Jesus, you love me. I know right now you love me. And from now on, I will rely. Woo! That's what the Word of God says. I will rely on the fact that you love me. And the moment you do that, your no faith has just become faith. And the power of God can begin to move through you. Josh, can you turn on my guitar? Stand with me. I don't think you need words for this one. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. me he who died heaven's gates to open wide it matters not how deep your sin by his blood we all go in yes Jesus loves me Oh, Lord, you love me. Oh, Lord Jesus, you love me. Oh, Lord, you love me. The Bible tells me so. Father, in Jesus' name, a fresh anointing of your love on people as they walk through this week. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Thanks for coming. See ya.